Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta. Of course, my name is Bryce. And today we're going to be going into part two of the book, The Return of the Divine Sophia. We're just going to be doing chapter three today. Last week, part one was a little bit long. And if you missed last week's part one, I will put a link to it down in the description box below, along with the whole playlist, Understanding the Magdalene. So let's go ahead and get into chapter three. There's going to be some Egyptian names in this chapter, and I apologize if I'm not saying them correctly. I will try to say them correctly, but please don't judge me. All right, so chapter three is called The Feather of Truth. I had not yet found a place upon which I could stand. I conceived the divine plan of law and order, not to make all forms. I was alone. I had not yet emitted Shu, nor had I yet emitted Tefnut, nor existed any other who could act together with me. One might think I could have devised easily into the study of the goddess, but in truth, I was afraid. While the idea of becoming an initiate of any golden path of wisdom strongly appeals to any seeker of truth, I knew the path to enlightenment has never been easy. No, it hasn't. Nothing good is ever easy. Again, that comes back to friction you have to have the friction and friction is always extremely uncomfortable thus i stepped back from taking the plunge there were several reasons for this the first was that i was a commercial advertising photographer and had a successful business in the quote-unquote real world my spiritual studies were private and even though i had a strong natural gifts of clairvoyance and clairaudience inner sight inner hearing same i have that too and frequently saw information about other people with my spiritual vision, I had always kept my esoteric interest private. To begin a study of the divine feminine would be a big step for me, and I wasn't sure how it would impact my worldview. Secondly, I knew that any true spiritual commitment can completely change your life. And at this time, when these events began to unfold, my spiritual training had already moved in another direction with an extraordinary group of spiritual masters I had encountered at the age of 19. These powerful but elusive sages taught about a process of meditation called soul travel which allows seekers to begin to experience the higher worlds for themselves, to activate their subtle spiritual bodies and use them to travel in the unseen realms of God, while still maintaining our lives in the three-dimensional world. I feel like that's kind of what a lot of us are doing now. I know for me, like I'm very aware that I'm existing here on the third density planet, talking to you guys on a camera, but I'm also heavily in the quantum. I know I'm astro traveling. I know I'm going off with certain people that aren't in my third density life anymore, but are with me in the quantum. I have memory of seeing them in the quantum. And I, so I, I hope that makes sense. I think a lot of us are kind of starting to experience this as we move into the ascension. These two worlds are going to start to merge together as one. Thank God, because I am sick of just seeing people in the quantum. If you're one of those people that I am seeing just in the quantum, I'm sick of just seeing you in the quantum. I want to see you in the third density world too. I was already being guided by wise, enlightened teachers, and I had just received my third initiation. The third reason that I stepped back from Shasta's invitation was my own Christian background. As a mystic who had been seen and heard and felt invisible worlds of spirit from the time I was a child, I knew that my studies were already beyond the bounds of my family's conservative belief system. My dad had been raised a Baptist and my mother was a Methodist. Yet none of the ministers I queried at our local churches seemed to know about the spiritual beings of light that I studied with at night in my dreams. They looked outside themselves for answers, relying on scripture to tell them what to say. I could see that there was no direct connection with the living intelligence of the divine and thus even within the houses of God's worship, the light was dim. And I agree. Of course, I believe the houses of worship, the Baptist church, the Methodist church, the Catholic church, the Episcopalian church, um, Lutheran, Pentecostal, all of the churches and all of the temples. I believe that they're all satanic. So that's why the light is dim. If you've been joining me on the dark outpost, you know that Penny is a insider who has been talking about that basically very graciously i'm so grateful for her she's been backing the research that stephanie and i have been doing 
claiming that these churches are not here for our highest good. And I will be bringing her on my channel at some point to tell her story. It will have to go to Rumble, but that is coming. So keep your eyes and ears open for that. As a child, I, I also noticed a great hypocrisy within the church. On the one hand, the church leaders seem to honor Jesus, the God of unconditional love. Yet on the other hand, they taught the doctrines of blame and guilt, fear and damnation from their pulpits, threatening punishment to all who did not conform. They also seem to cultivate a rivalry between the various factions of their own Christian creed while preaching to their congregation, judge not these ye be judged. This made no sense to me. How could the God of unconditional love be a fearful, angry God of wrath? How could they preach tolerance and forgiveness, yet make other people their enemies? Same questions I've had my whole life. Same questions probably a lot of you have had your whole life. And now we know the answer to that. That is because the God of the Bible is Lucifer, not source creator. Perhaps discouraged by these same observations, my mother took it upon herself to find a gentler approach to Jesus that we could all identify with. When I was 10, she discovered a, a sweet Episcopalian parish about five miles from our house. I was confirmed there at the tender age of 13. I loved the sacred rituals with their formal robes and wafting incense. The gatherings were kind and heartfelt, and I was grateful not to hear the threat of fire and brimstone every Sunday. I knew even then that each of us comes into this world again and again to perfect our inner natures and that the love and kindness are keys to shaping our inner natures in the divine image. No matter what the pomp or circumstance of religion, it is the province of the heart that the real wisdom dwells. So at the time I met Shasta, my older sister and her preacher husband had become fundamentalist. My dad was still a Baptist and my younger sister and my mother were evangelists. They believed that Jesus was the only spiritual teacher who had ever told the truth, the only guide to salvation. I believed that there had been many great spiritual avatars and masters who had come to this planet. Jesus was the latest and perhaps the greatest world teacher, the one who had come to bring the message of the age of Pisces, a 2,160 year cycle that had begun about 400 years before he was born. From what I could see, the message had been corrupted, and even as a child, I felt the great imbalance the male-dominated patriarchal had imposed on the world, so I was leery about pushing a path that might take me even further from my family's belief. Yeah, Jesus is not the Christ. Jesus is Mithra. Yahshua and Magdalene were the teachers of the Christ. Everybody's the Christ. Like, that's, we have to stop saying wasn't the Christ, because everybody's, you're the Christ. You watching, you're the Christ. You have the Christ consciousness in your Kundalini. Magdalene and Yahshua came in to start to teach that, to not bring on the age of Pisces, but to bring on the Tartarian age, because we know we know that the true God does not demand human sacrifice. Mithra was sacrificed. Jesus was sacrificed because their God is Lucifer. And Lucifer does the whole human sacrifice thing. The light, the true God, we don't we don't play. We don't play with sacrifices like that, right? So Let's just be clear about that. All right. The magical world of spirit. Born with the gift of inner sight and hearing, I spent the best days of my childhood in a forest across from my parents' house, communing with the trees and magical springs that bubbled up from the earth. This was the church of God that I knew and loved. And it was in the forest that I wrote my first poems to God, listening to the small, still voice that speaks within. There I learned to see the fairy realms and the elemental spirits that oversee the planet and animal kingdoms. So she has an asterisk here. I know what elementals are, but I'm going to go ahead and read the asterisks in the, uh, the place at the bottom in case there are people who don't know what they are. The elemental spirits or devas are natural spirits from the angelic kingdom that serve in accordance to God's will to assist nature. So like fairies, leprechauns, like that kind of stuff. Yeah. Like the guardian angels of the human world, these elemental spirits supervise the world of nature. And sometimes when I was very still, I could even hear the trees talking and the rustling of the leaves. But these flashes of knowing swept in and out, borne on the wings of their own mysterious currents. I did not know how to control these gifts. They came and went as they would. Same, 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 same. And the same thing happened to me as a kid. I'm sure a lot of you watching had the same. You didn't know how to control. I still don't know how to control. I'm still learning how to control. I'm at 39. So... 
I know now years later as a long time initiate of the mysteries that the gifts of inner sight, hearing and feeling and knowing are just a part of the naturally unfolding gifts of every spiritual aspirant. The masters teach that there are 33 of these inner gifts, which we acquire on our own spiritual road to God, including the gifts of healing and telepathy, levitation and lucid dreaming. So let's go ahead down to lucid dreaming. The four main gifts are clairvoyance, inner sight, clairaudience, inner hearing, clairsentience, inner feeling, claircognitive abilities, or inner knowing. Each of these gifts may develop in different order according to the personal history, experience, and life plan of a seeker. Other gifts include mind-to-mind -mind communication, such as, such as telepathy, the ability to move objects with the mind, also called telekinesis, plant and animal communication, and the gift of lucid dreaming, which allows us to develop a conscious gateway into the inner planes. I think I kind of have all of these. Um, I have never moved anything with my mind, but I keep feeling, I was telling my friend the other day, I keep feeling like my hands can be like, I keep wanting to like put my hands out and like do things. I don't know. Maybe I'm crazy. I don't know, but I keep wanting to like do that. All right. But since there was no one there to teach me except the tall forest angels that appeared from time to time, I spent my time in the woods in prayer, hoping fervently that someone wiser would come along to connect the dots. Little did I know that the great Baraji masters who had heard the call would arrive to initiate me into their teachings when I was 19 years old. The Baraji masters. Okay. The Virajis are an unbroken line of spiritual adepts whose purpose is spiritual liberation of the soul within this lifetime. Like Jesus, they are interested in helping people free themselves from the burden of the worlds of suffering. I had first met the elusive adepts in the spring of my sophomore year of college at Florida State University. They were the great spiritual teachers I had prayed for in my early years. Not only do they understand how the multidimensional planes of the universe are layered, but they knew the spiritual me mechanisms that allowed us to travel from one di dimension to another. Discovering the Vairagis was like finding the roadmap to creation. The name Vairagi derives from the, scranch, the Sanskrit root Viagra, meaning detachment. So I know that sounds like the, the sex drug. But it's Viagra, meaning to detach. And we talk about this a lot in yoga. This is coming from, I knew that, I, I know what this is. This is coming from the great uh, spiritual teachings of the East. The name lies at the heart of their mission. For these sages have become detached from the affairs of the world and follow a path of inner truth. Unlike those of us still ensnared in our emotions, minds, sexuality, or materialism, they focus on the inner landscape of heaven, transcending the physical plane through soul travel. They have, Viraga teach that the three purest aspects of God are love, sound, and light, the trinity of creation itself. Love is the force that binds the universe together, the very fabric of creation. It is the essence from which all things are composed, the constantly moving adamantine particles that are the living body of the cosmos itself. Sound is the mechanism through which all worlds come into being, the underlying vibration that creates and sustains all things. In Freemasonry, this is called the lost note. This essential knowledge has been rediscovered by our physical scientists today and is referred to as a spring theory. In the beginning was the word, begins the Gospel of John. This is the sound current that has been known as Alm, the Shabda, the Vani, the Nada, and the music of the spheres. So let's go down to, there's a, an asterisk here too. Science now calls these sound particles phonons, which became light particles or photons. They are joined together by gluons, the waveforms of sound's transmission into the waveform of light. Many of us had heard the roar of this current in the movement before we dropped into sleep. Through specific exercises, the Vairagi teach the aspiring initiate to surf these sounds towards the center of creation. We find a reference to this in Edmund Bordeaux Zelensky, a scene in Gospel of Peace. And this is from the Essene Gospel of Peace. And when the sun is in the high heavens, then you shall seek the holy stream of sound. In the heat of noontime, all creatures are still and seek the shade. The angel of the earthly mother are silent for a space. Then it is that you shall let into your ears the holy stream of sound, for it can only be heard in silence. Truly, this is the voice of God, if you did not know it. For it is written, and the beginning was the sound, and the sound was God, and the word was God. I tell you truly, when we are born, we enter the world within the sound of God in our ears. 
even the singing of the vast chorus of the sky and the holy chants of the stars in their fixed rounds. It is then that the holy stream of sound transverses the vault of stars and crosses the endless kingdom of the heavenly father. And I will say again, we know it sounds like she's still a little bit confused about some things that we've learned now, but that's okay. That's okay. The awakening happens slowly. The, um, the real Yahshua, the real Magdalene, of course, we know were not, the truth is they were not born Jewish. They were born into the priest and priesthood of Isis. They were Egyptian. And the Essenes, so the original spelling of Isis is E-S-S-E. So that's the Essenes. The Essenes were the priest and priesthood of Isis. The Essenes are mentioned in the Bible. Again, if you've been on this channel for a while, you know that's where we get the, the name Tennessee is the country of Isis, where the Isis temple is in the um, Norris Dam. This is why the controllers, the Freemasons, have had to try to flip it to make the Isis and Osiris teachings satanic and make the Bible good. But we know that the Bible is actually satanic and the, the teachings of Isis and Osiris are the true healings of God. This is also where we get Alm. And I, I know I've spoken about this before. Patanjali in sutras, he tells you that the proper name of Ishvara or God is Om because Om has no beginning and no end. It's a vibration. So if you chant Om, you feel it resonating through your body. If you go out in nature, you'll also hear, if you're really quiet, you'll hear nature Alming with the vibration, the sound frequency of God, right? So it's all connected. The Varagi teach that the creation is divided into many dimensions, all vibrating at slightly different frequencies. The Alm is the mechanism that allows each dimension to come into existence. Sound organizes atoms into the shapes that we recognize, creating form, mass, height, and weight. Yet this sound is beyond duality, emanating from every atom. Through the hearing of the cosmic vibration, we can establish a direct contact with Christ consciousness itself. As the divine vibration moves out through the world of form, it generates friction, creating sun and stars in the entire spectrum of visible light. That's what I've been saying, y'all. You got to have friction. If you think spirituality is just about being peaceful all the time and looking for those unicorns, that's not spirituality. You have to have that friction to create that light, the Shiva, the Shakti. You can't, the Shiva, the soul can't create the expression of the soul, the Shakti, without friction to do so. So anyway, and it has been said that the sun itself is a visual expression of this word. Sound brings all things into being from a state of potentialized possibility. This is why it has been said in magic that to know the true name of a thing is to also command it. Hence why Lucifer's real name is Yeldabeth, and they tried to not tell us it was Lucifer because Yeldabeth is his real name. We talked about that in uh, one of the Apocryphon books. We don't know his real name. We don't know how to like get rid of him, right? This, oh, and that's also why, you know, I get really upset if you're taking yoga classes, you should be speaking Sanskrit. You should not be calling yoga postures by their English names. That is entirely disrespectful, first of all. Second of all, the Sanskrit has a vibration of healing. So if you're calling the postures by their proper names or Sanskrit names, you are healing. You are starting the vibration of healing. If you're not doing it, if you're teaching yoga and you're not calling them by the Sanskrit names, you should not be teaching yoga. Just point blank period and that's why because the three rules of ayurveda are sound or excuse me our breath food and vibration vibration is sound and sanskrit is a holy light language this brings us to light the transmitter of heat warmth and illumination without life nothing would have life thus the ancient saw the sun as a visible symbol of god itself the un unmanifested source behind all things it was this profound image that I have seen painted on the walls of the dormitory rooms in a dream so long ago, the ancient symbol for the sun. The ancients believed that there is both a physical and spiritual sun, the supreme benefactor of the material and spiritual worlds. The Mayans called this the Hunab Ku, a term meaning one meaning in one measure, one heartbeat behind it all. This is the great central sun or the light that lights the world. Paracelsus, the famous alchemist of the 15th century wrote, there is an earthly sun and there is an eternal sun, which is the source of all wisdom. And those whose spiritual senses have awakened to life will see that the sun has been conscious of his existence. But those who have not yet attained spiritual consciousness may yet feel his power by an inner facility, which is called intuition. Franz Hartmann, the German theosophist and friend of renowned theosophist, Madame Helen 
Blavatsky writes, the sun is the center of power of heart of things. The sun is the symbol of wisdom, a storehouse of power. Each living being contains within itself a center of life, which may grow to be a sun. Yes, the solar plexus right here. Your Helios is right here in the solar plexus. And also I'm going to say too, the sun we've had is not our real sun. Because the controllers, the uh, Luciferians, they want to mimic God. So they created a fake sun. That's why people are seeing two suns right now. The real one's coming back. The terrestrial sun is the image or reflection of the invisible celestial sun. The former is in the realms of spirit, while the latter is in the realms of matter. For the latter receives its power from the former. Hence, throughout the centuries, many knew that the spiritual realms are the true world of cause, while the physical world is the ground of effect. Yeah, what happens in the quantum? It, it has to happen in the quantum first. In simple terms, this means that our thoughts, beliefs, and words have the power to change our reality. Our cultures are generated by what we think, feel, and do, and shaping the very foundation of the world we experience. So some 25 years ago, when I first met Shasta, this was the path that I was traveling about Isis. I knew only that she had been a great queen of Egypt and that long ago with her husband Osiris and her son Horus, she had been part of the most famous trinity in all of, the, all of Egypt for over 7,000 years. Legends surrounded her, myths of courage, resurrection, and eternal life. But I had not yet de devolved into these matters too deeply then. I was deep in the lesson of my third initiation with the masters of the Far East. So now let's talk about the awesome power of initiation itself. This section is the reluctant initiate. There is a classic story about a young seeker who was eager to have his second initiation. He had come to his master full of ambition and he wanted to advance quickly up the ranks. Every day, he would say to his teacher, give me my second initiation, please. Give me my second initiation, please. I beg of you. All in time. His patient master would reply, all in time. But in Achilla's mind, it was not fast enough. He ranked all the initiates according to their initiation levels. So whenever he met any of the other disciples, he would ask, what initiation are you? This told the cello whom he should be friends with and whom he should try to emulate. Some would nod and say proudly, I am a second initiate. Others would scratch their chins and say, thoughtfully, I am a third initiate. So others would take a deep breath and sigh quietly. Hmm, I am a fourth initiate. The older ones would smile kindly, shake their heads and say in a compassionate tone, yes, I am a fifth initiate. One day at the cello sat in audience with his master. He watched as other disciples were summoned. As the student bowed in respect before his teacher, the master spoke, Zutsu, it is now time for me to offer you your sixth initiation. Are you ready? Oh, no, master, the older dis disciple protested. Please don't give me another initiation, master, I beg of you. The young chila was shocked. As Zutsu left the master's building, the boy ran after him, caught him by arm. Why, he stammered incredulously, why would you turn down such an opportunity? That is all any of us want, to become great masters. The wise student smiled down at him and said, when I entered the master's teaching during my first initiation, I left my family's business and gave up my inheritance, thus learning to place the inner world above the outer world. During my second initiation, I let go of my wife and children who could not find their way to any spiritual path, let alone mine. And thus I learned detachment and to allow others to pursue their own evolutionary paths. During my third initiation, I came down with a crippling disease and discovered that beneath it was my own suppressed rage from childhood and the anger at losing my family. I released it and healed. And then in my fourth initiation, my house was swept away by a flood and I went to live in the forest, learning to eat the seeds and berries. There I learned humility, appreciation for animals and plants, and to move into sympathetic resonance with nature. Finally, during my last initiation, I died twice and came back from the dead, becoming a twice born. Now I'm just beginning to walk the path of my true immortality. The young Chila's mouth hung open. It was a moment before he could even gather his wits. But why? He blurted out before he could stop himself. Why do you keep going at all? Zitzit smiled. Because in losing all these things, I have found something greater. The Chila could barely utter the words, but what? What is that? I have found myself. And we say that, I've said this before on this channel and the Ashtanga lineage that I teach, we always say the easiest people to teach are the beginners and the advanced students. 
because both the beginners and the advanced students know that they know nothing. It's the intermediate students that are the hard ones to teach because they think they know everything. The catalyst event. So what propels us to begin the search for deeper truth? What sets our feet on the path to awakening? For some of us, it is a tragedy, a change of life so profound that it sweeps away all the old, comfortable answers that we have relied on to understand the world. Whether it be the death of a child, the end of a marriage, the dissolution of a, of a career, or the wiping away of our dreams through some financial crisis, the usual answer will not suffice. Pain becomes the catalyst that mobilizes us to take action. And we search for something greater than the predictable version of reality we have been inculcated with since childhood. For some, it is like a siren song in the quiet moments when we are most alone. It hovers like an unspoken yearning beyond the day-to-day -day bus busyness of our lives, a longing ancient beyond years. This is the cry of the soul calling for itself. It whispers of a time when we knew more, understood more, and were connected to our eternal self. It is the remembrance of an age when growing up meant growing into mastery, and wisdom was the real goal of life. But the modern mind, now trained by the distractions of our swift and superficial societies to ignore such whispers, brushes it aside until finally the mechanism of pain and suffering forces us to listen. So it was for me. Many things had changed in my life before I was ready to step into the path with Shasta. So it was to be nearly five long years before I began my studies with her. My engagement to a music producer in Britain had ended in heartbreak, and I had returned to the States on my knees in prayer. I entered a dark under the soul where I remained for nearly a year and a half while trying to rebuild my photography business, my home, and all the things that I had abandoned when I left for England. This is the mystical death that precedes resurrection. Where one descends to the depths of one's sorrow or pain, a time of crisis where the seeker must be willing to endure this dying of the old self that precedes spiritual rebirth. Out of the ashes came a new beginning. Each day, as I knelt down by my altar to pray, I began to hear angels' voices raised in song, con constantly praising the divine. In the process, my inner spiritual gifts of clairvoyance and clairaudience took a leap to another level. Later, I was to learn that this process of dying to the old self is considered essential to the path of enlightenment, absolutely. Tom Alachi, a modern-day Christian Gnostic, writes, Dying is part of your living. You cannot have one without the other. Everything is interconnected and interdependent. It is the nature of things ever becoming. You must learn to accept and embrace the whole of life and the whole of yourself if you would discover the spirit and truth. The light and the darkness must be joined and you must realize the sacred unity. Only later did I realize how true this was and this wisdom was at the very heart of the great mother. The ancients have called this power process of dying and being reborn initiation. And like the reluctant initiate Zitsu, it was always about letting go of what we have once held dear to find a more enduring path. The Christian term, term it as being born again since the death of the ego allows a powerful shift in consciousness that then propels us towards a greater spiritual awakening. The structures that had once supported our life come crashing down and in their place something greater is born. Like Zitsu, this ego death ultimately leads us to our higher self. In my meditations, I began to hear angels singing in constant praise of the divine. I heard messages about the nature of love and spiritual surrender. And I began to actively discourse with these higher spiritual beings of light. People began asking me to do readings for them. And my clairvoyant abilities increased as I began to see past lives of those around me, as well as the arc of their present mission here on earth. I found myself tracking the reasons behind their blocks and traumas and relationships and fears and backwards through time. For the first four years, I did these readings without ever charging money. But in time, there was such a demand for my sessions that it began impacting my ability to respond to my photography advertising clients. And as with all the gifts of the spirit, when we serve from a place of the heart, our gifts have a life of their own. In time, my desire to help others allowed me to discover the core wound behind my client's loneliness, separation, and abandonment issues. And I realized that at the root of this suffering was our inability to realize that we are never alone and that we have never been abandoned by God. 
During these re readings, I also began to see angels around people, wonderful spirit guides who were completely committed to the enlightenment of my clients. Some of these guides were there to help families, relationships, or career. Others were there as sources of inspiration for someone's artistic or creative talents. Some were connected to a person's spiritual mission, while other guides had been a part of their spiritual team for many lifetimes. All this made me start to wonder about my own guardian angels. And at one point, I realized that while I could see other spirit guide guides quite well, I had no idea about my own. How could I find out who they were? Who could help me with this dilemma? I could think of no one better suited to guide me on this path, on this path than Shasta. Seeing the unseen. I arrived at Shasta's house apprehensive but excited. It had been almost five long years since our first encounter, and although I had never approached her for a private session, we had continued to stay in touch. We often crossed paths at the symposiums that I had produced in Atlanta area on a variety of scientific, paranormal, or metaphysical topics. Was it possible that Shasta would be able to help me make a breakthrough now? If I could see other people's guides so clearly, why couldn't I see my own? Having worked so closely with the Vairagi Masters for over a decade, I had never questioned who my spirit guides were. I had simply assumed that these masters were my only teachers, but that couldn't be right. Each of us has at least two and sometimes three spirit angels and guides who have agreed to help us accomplish our life's goals. Certainly, I had the right to know my own allies, didn't I? Magdalene is one of my guides. And as she talked about over lifetimes, I did have a life with Magdalene, the, the, the life, the life where she came as Magdalene. I had a very interesting connection to her, which one day I'll share. I'm not ready to share it yet, but one day I'll share my connection to her through lifetime. And now she's one of my guides. Shasta met me at the door of her little cottage and led me inside. We sat in the kitchen and I laid out my problems. Why can't I see my own guides? I asked in frustration in frustration, especially when I could see everybody else's, I want to know is helping me from the other side. She listened quietly and then took me by the hand, leading me into the healing room. Lie down, she instructed, pointing to the bed. She handed me two large double terminated crystals, one for each hand, then placed a silk pouch over my eyes. Now I want you to simply breathe, she instructed, her voice a soothing balm. I am going to move some energy blocks out of your field and then we'll see where this takes us as she began to work my muscles relaxed and my mind slipped into a quiet state I began to see flickering lights floating all around me in my inner vision the faces of many different kinds of being appeared and disappeared as if greeting me in turn angels animals masters and even Egyptian divinities floated in and out of my consciousness Nature spirits and elementals swept in and I could hear melodies from the higher levels like a chorus of angels voices playing on the radio, its volume moving up and down like a wave. After a while, I lost all track of time and the separate images stopped and all I could see was a golden light. I don't know how much time had passed before Shasta touched me on the hand. She took the true two crystals from my palms and slowly lifted the eye pouch. I could vaguely see from the shadows in the room that it was now late afternoon. Everybody is here, she said in a quiet voice. The angels, the masters, the fairies, the elementals, the gods, and the goddesses. The question is, who do you want to work with? They are all interested in you. I sat up slowly blinking. Really? I saw them. Or at least I think I did. There were a lot of lights. Shasta smiled. Yes, I know. What do I do now? I asked, swinging my legs over the side of the bed. Go home and call them in. Decide who you want to work with. I, I only want to work with the highest energy, I said. She helped me up and handed me an orange. Eat this before you drive. You are not back in your body yet. That just gave me chills because I know what that feels like. I, I think I told you guys, like I've just learned recently that I know how to astro travel and apparently I've been astro traveling my whole life and I figured it out with Stephanie because I started to all of a sudden, I got hit one day where I was, I think I told you guys a story. I was sitting down on the sofa. It was like two o'clock in the afternoon. I was editing and all of a sudden I just 
boom, went out and I went somewhere. When I came back, I had a hard time coming back in my body. But this is something that has happened to me my whole life. I just didn't know that it was astro traveling. I had no idea that I had this ability and that my whole life, another part of me has been in the quantum doing other things. And, you know, no one ever tells you that when you grow up in a, a typical family, you know, a modern family, no one's telling you that that's what's happening to you. And so the whole idea about not being back in your body, like that sent shivers down my spine. Cause I know what that feels like. I know exactly what that feels like. So, um, I get that. And that's the thing, the thing I do too, is like when I, it happens to me and I come back and I'm not in my body. The first thing I do is I reach for something to eat to try to like pull my system back into the physical realm. Eat this before you drive. You are not back in your body yet and you will need to be grounded to get home. I nodded. What did she mean? Go home and decide who you want to work with. What were my choices? Oh, I guess she had already told me that. Slowly, I walked back to my car deep in thought. It was now dusk. I sat in the front seat and ate my orange. Then I drove home slowly. Two weeks later, my two spirit guides arrived and completely changed my life. And again, I hope I'm saying these names right. Ariel and Rigel, the mother and father of creation. Their names are Rigel and Ariel, and they told me that they had been with me since the beginning of time. They are aspects of the divine father and mother, and I would like to introduce you to these profound presences now, although we will be encountering them in various ways throughout this book. Ariel is the mother and Rigel is the father of all that lives and breathes. Of course, they have been known by many names throughout the centuries and religions across the world, but no matter what they are called, they are the same eternal presences at the heart of creation itself. Rigel appears as a large golden eagle whose wings span the universe. This is doubtless a metaphor for the one who can see into every mind and heart and yet is above them all. While Rigel communicates to me through both words and form, it is always through the power of the direct transmission of, or frequency that he comes into my field. Many seers have beheld the same transcendent eagle as a symbol of the divine father, including mystics within the Native American tradition, as well as the Egyptians, Plato, Carl Jung, and the Aki shamans of Central American. Ariel is the divine mother of love, whose sweet energy leads us back to the heart. She first appeared as a moving wave form of light and sound, a fountain of loving peak and gold energies. I could see no defined form when she first appeared, but as the months and years passed, I was to discover that she took endless forms in all the great traditions of the world. I am the doorway of eternity, she told me, the white dove of hope that enters every age as a promise of that which can be. I am the dreams of the holy and the visions of men of reason. Mine is a blue cloak of daybreak. The bird's song at morning. Mine is the mantle of the evenings and the starlight of heaven's hem. I'm the first thought that ever was. The portal to your own becoming. I'm the snowflakes on your frozen lashes and the tears of your sorrow. I am she who is always present, waiting endlessly, loving endlessly, hoping endlessly that my children will awaken. In the many years that I was to study with her, she always entered my heart with great compassion and kindness. Hers were the tears of the suffering of humanity, and she gave me many dis discourses about the nature of human pain. One day she said to me, who has told you that our lives were meant for suffering and pain? I have not. Who has told you that you must toil beneath the yoke of sacrifice? I have not. I saw in my inner vision of suffering of humanity and the self-imposed struggles we all place on ourselves every day. But Ariel continued, it is my will that you rejoice in one another and share joy as the effervescent sparkle of light shimmering at the fullness of the water's edge. That you honor my fields and crops, my fruits and flowers, and bless them with your energy as they have blessed you with theirs. Her powerful presence seemed to enter my heart and expand it with compassion. I saw vast fields of flowers, orchards, wheat, and corn, and sunlight over golden plains. It is my will that you acknowledge. All right, normally I would edit this out, but um, something literally just touched my head and like started to rub it. If you guys saw anything in the screen, will you let me know down in the comment section below? Because I got a little dizzy while I was reading that and I felt someone literally do this to my head. So, which happens to me a lot. And I just cut it out of the editing process, but let me know if you saw something because that felt weird. That felt different. 
Her powerful presence seemed to enter my heart and expand it with compassion. I saw a vast field of flowers, orchards, wheat and corn and sunlight over the golden plains. It is my will that you acknowledge the four-footed, the winged, the small, and the fury, the hoofed, and the clawed, and the tribes of your brothers and sisters who live at your sides. If you could, int- if you could but remember the languages that they speak, you would know who they are besides you, no less, no more, but part of ourselves. These are my other children as, sh- children as surely as you. I saw a stag appear in the woods with his large antlered head and noble countenance. Then other animals appeared around him. Deer, rabbits, raccoons, wolves, bears, pumas, tigers, even elephants. And I knew that many of these animals were going extinct through the greed, brutality, and hunting of men. It is my greatest hope that you might learn to live with one another in compassion and tolerance, for you are no longer little children. The squabbles of your adolescence should have been left behind long ago. I knew that the mother was speaking about the spiritual maturity of our societies that seemed to simply repeat the same patterns over and over again, the same imperialistic government, the same warmongering, the same tyrannical obs- obsession with greed and negative control that has, been ca- that has caused cycle after cycle of self-destruction. She was right. We should have grown these games of victim and victimizer long ago. There is only one God, she said, and that God is love. It matters not what you call it. The source of sources expresses itself through everything and everyone, coursing through the universe as a sacred sound filling every vessel. I am that vessel, and all that it is, is created moves through me. The portal opens. Perhaps because of these profound teachers and my own surrendered state, my spiritual gifts made a quantum shift. Now, when I pulled up each of my clients' soul records, I could follow their journeys back through time, tracing the quick connections between husbands and wives, parents and children, or any individual who had known each other in the past. I could find the soulmate agreements that bound them and understand why these individuals were in each other's lives again. I also began to see not only the angelic protectors around my clients, but sometimes shamanic animals, creative muses, or even masters. All these were spiritual allies from the other side who had come to support my clients as part of their spirit team. But on occasion, I would see a different kind of guide that I could only describe as a divinity or God or goddess. The first time this happened, I was in San Diego reading for three lovely creative women. One of these women was an overlit by Aphrodite, the goddess of love, a presence vulnerable in the Mediterranean. In the second reading, I saw a beautiful Middle Eastern desert goddess who hovered over my female client and told her her name was Ishtar. I saw her walking around the desert sands and felt that she had known the great loss and pain that somehow had to do with losing her love. She was a protective goddess for tribal people, even men in battle. This is where we get Easter from, too, guys, Ishtar. The real Easter, not the fake one that church tries to sell you. She showed me her symbols, a crescent moon and the planet Venus, but I had never heard of her before. The third woman was overseen by the goddess who called herself Mat. Hope I'm saying that right, Mahat Mat. She arose from a rich, deep earth as a primordial principle of the mother herself and seemed to come from Africa. Of course, I had heard about Aphrodite in high school, but I had never heard of Mat or Ishtar. Each of these goddesses seemed to be a massive, benevolent energy with her own symbols, personality, and gifts. How is it possible, I asked myself, would such beings still existed unless they had lived in higher realms? Were they some kind of archetype deities who oversaw humanity's development? Did they exist independent of human thought or were they the residual imprint of long live extraterrestrial gods or goddesses from our past who had once existed on our planet? They seemed completely interactive and present with me, but drawing on my own worldview, I could not understand how they could exist in these contemporary worlds. I realized that I had to find out more about them when I got back to Atlanta. The feather of Mutt or Mahat. How to a pronoun. Ma'at. Ma'at. So it's Ma'at. 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 Okay. I'm going to have to look into Ma'at. Okay, Ma'at. All right. When I returned to Atlanta, I made a trip to my local Barnes & Noble. In the bookstore, I spread out the books I collected around me in a circle. They came from a variety of departments. There were coffee table books on gods and goddesses of ancient Egypt, Rome, and Greece, and other books on angels, the great mother, and related topics. 
I flipped open the Egyptian coffee table book, looking for the section on goddesses. Ma'at was the first to appear. With her dark brown skin and deep, wise continents, the book said to come from Nubia. The book opened to a page with her picture, and I looked down, stunned. Here was a spinning image of the Egyptian statue that I had seen all those years earlier in aluminum, the store where I had first met Shasta. One tall feather rose from her head, held in place by a simple headband. Ma'at, the goddess of cosmic truth. I read beneath the picture. Hmm. What did that mean? Next, I opened historian Barbara Walker's Women's Encyclopedia of Myths and Secrets. It was a thick book that Shasta had recommended. A veritable encyclopedia of hidden history. Her listings were alphabetical. I flipped to the M's and found Ma'at, an Egyptian goddess and the personification of truth. The original name is based on universal Indo-European mother symbol Ma, which simply meant mother. Holy cow, I sat back in my chair. This was an interesting coincidence to say the least. Not only did Ma'at represent the pursuit of spiritual truth, but her presence was like a signal leading to the deeper mysteries. Was Ma'at how we had gotten the original word for mama? Was Mary's name also derived from the same source? Was Ma'at the Holy Mother herself? That's not where Mary's name comes from, guys. But I do think mama, maybe. I closed my eyes, recalling the smooth ebony statue that I had seen in the store with the two feathers extending from her headdress. I summoned up the image of the goddess who had appeared in my readings. She was the quintessential grandmother of wisdom. She arose from the earth, ancient as time. Ma'at had told me that she was connected with the rhythms of the universe and had shown me a single feather that seemed to represent morality, law, or truth. Is this what her two feathers had meant? I continued down the page excitedly. Ma'at symbol, I read, was a feather against which she had weighed each man's heart and soul in her underground halls of judgment. There it was, the feather, I continued to read. I've been seeing a lot of feathers lately. Let me know if you've been seeing feathers a lot. I've been seeing a lot of feathers. Like every time I go outside, there's feathers around. So I always just thought that meant the angels were watching, but that just kind of gave me goosebumps again. Let me know if you guys have seen feathers too. Thus the plume of Ma'at itself became a hieroglyphic for truth. The same feathers of truth were worn by other aspects of the goddess, such as Isis, who was the same law-giving mother. I paused to breathe this in. Isis, Ma'at was connected to the priestess of Isis, who had called me to join them long ago. What did all this mean? The memory of the statue of Ma'at rose in my mind. The goddess of truth had been there from the beginning. I focused my eyes on the page once again, my mind now racing. I read Ma'at's laws govern all three worlds, and thus she is known as the lady of heaven, queen of earth, and the mistress of the underworld. Ma'at was the lawgiver of ancient Egypt. My heart jumped. Did the book say something about Nubia? In my vision, I had seen her arise from the rich soil of Nubia. I read on. The book quoted a writer who had compared his own countrymen to the honest Ma'at worshipping tribes of Nubia. Holy smokes, there it was. Ma'at was apparently deeply involved with the weighing of the heart ceremonies between lifetimes. On Judgment Day, Egyptians believed that they stood before the throne of Osiris, the Egyptian god of resurrection, and allowed their hearts to be weighed against the feather of truth. If your heart was light as a feather, then you got to enter heaven. But if you still had a heavy heart, an angry heart, or an unforgiving heart, then you had to return to earth to resolve your karma. Not hell. Do it again. This is what the missing gospels tell us too, guys, of Joshua's teachings. That there is no hell. You just keep coming back until you figure it out. But if the church taught you that, then they wouldn't have a power over you, would they? This all happened in the halls of Amati, the the antechamber of the heaven. This was the 42 lords of karma present. As the soul protested its innocence before the council of light, thought the scribe of the gods wrote the results in the book of life. The, these were some of the things each soul had to declare. I have not been a man of anger. I have done no evil to mankind. I have not inflicted pain. I have made none to weep. I have done violence to no man. I have not done harm unto animals. I have not robbed the poor. I have not fouled water. I have not trampled fields. I have not behaved with insolence. I have not judged hastily. I have not stirred up strife. 
I have not made any man to commit murder for me. I have not insisted that excessive work be done for me daily. I have not borne false witness. I have not stole, stolen land. I have not cheated in measuring the bushel. I have allowed no man to suffer for hunger. I have not increased my wealth except with such things that are my own possessions. I have not seized wrongfully the property of others, and I have not taken milk from the mother mouths of babes. Holy cow. I couldn't think of anybody who lived that honestly. The Egyptians must have had very high moral standards. Yes, yes, they did. They had very high moral standards. We were told that the Egyptians were the bad guys and Moses and his posse were the good guys. If you read the Ak Moses tablet, though, it's backwards. Moses was a dark warlock who worked with Grimoire's black magic where the Egyptians were working with light. So it's all inverted. You have to invert everything. I opened a third book. It was called Angels and Archetypes. The table of content revealed an entire chapter on Mahat. Below her pictures were these words. Mahat, the Nurt goddess that personifies the principle of the cosmic order. The concept by which not only men, but also the gods themselves were governed. She represents the embodiment of accuracy, honesty, fairness, faithfulness, authenticity, legitimacy, integrity, and justice, the absence of rhythm, the divine order of the universe that has re reigned since the beginning. Ma'at is the motivating force in the universe that drives us to become conscious. For in essence, the universe is pure consciousness itself. One who achieves double Ma'at is one who has merged their individual consciousness with the cosmic consciousness. I sat back trying to take it all in. This was saying that all cosmic order in the universe symbolized by Mahat follow the principles of divine law to bring us back into alignment with the creator. Absolutely. This meant that all karmic challenges we go through are part of the me mechanism of Mahat that will allow each of us to reach mastery someday. That's why I keep telling you guys that no one can pay for your karma. No guy on a cross can pay for your karma. Believing so is denying yourself the privilege of working through your karma. It's your work. It's, what, it's the gift God gives you. Perhaps this goddess had appeared in my life long ago to remind me of something I had forgotten. And this was somehow connected to the priestess of Isis. I must call Shasta, I realized. Only she might have the power to help me unravel this puzzle. Who were the priestess of Isis? What was it about the gods or the goddesses that was so important? If these beings have lived long ago, how is it possible to interact with them in current time, to have them appear as spirit guides or teachers? I didn't know. Despite my fear of stepping outside of my comfort zone, I knew that it was finally time for me to search for answers. <laughs>